Please welcome to the stage, Robert Friedland, founder and executive co-chairman of Ivanhoe Mines, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Eric Schatzker. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Robert, we're the last act. Amazing. You'd better be entertaining. <laughs> you have a message, and I'm going to summarize it as this. The green transition to a low-carbon economy that everybody wants will be impossible unless the world wakes up and realizes that it needs more copper, more nickel, more cobalt, more manganese, more lithium, and I could go on. There are several other minerals in the equation. You have, I might say, been pounding the table, and your message is a compelling one. It's a persuasive one, and it's an urgent one. Why isn't the message getting through? Hmm. Well, everything we do, um, everything we touch, we either mined it or we grew it agriculturally. And our species is trying to green the world economy by reducing the consumption of coal and hydrocarbon in the way we generate electrical energy, transmit electro electrical energy, and actually utilize it in an object like a microwave oven or a washing machine or your electric car. As a species, we have to find a way to mine more copper in the next 20 to 25 years than we've mined throughout human history in a period when most of the great copper mines have already been mined and are depleted. If we picture the periodic table behind us, copper conducts electrical energy, making these lights better than any other metal than gold and silver, which are too expensive for the purpose. So the electrification of the world economy requires our species to reinvent mining, go to new places, and to completely change the way we relate to local communities to make mining a sustainable enterprise. So as I say, it all makes sense. Why isn't the message getting through? In New York, people think a ham sandwich uh, comes from a refrigerator. They never picture 40,000 pigs per day being slaughtered in a river of blood outside Chicago. So we are divorced from the supply chain. People flew here in airplanes or drove here in cars. If you're guilty of going to a hospital or riding a bicycle, you need metal. And the problem is that the real story of how the supply chain works is not well told. Bill Gates' favorite book is How the World Really Works by Rocklev Smill. When you read that book, you start to understand how critically important natural gas is to the world economy. You know a little bit about how I and others think, and it would seem to me that if this were as much of a problem as you want us to believe it is, we would see it reflected in the prices of copper, of cobalt, of nickel, of manganese, of lithium, and these other minerals. And the truth of the matter is that while copper has had a good run, it's on its way down. And none of those other metals, at least to the best of my ability, to identify the prices are trading anywhere near records. Mm. What's wrong? The only thing we know for sure about metals prices is that they will fluctuate. Uh, uh, with mining, we have to have a very long-term horizon. It takes 10 or 15 years to discover a large mine. It takes another five or 10 years to build it. And then they run for a century. Mm -hmm. So we just can't be um, disturbed by the vagaries and the fashions of trends in financial markets, and that's part of the dilemma. We need patient, long-term capital. Look at the development of the North Field here in Qatar. Amazing, and so essential to keeping Europe warm at night. It takes decades to develop this kind of fundamental, basic resource. And without it, we're really going to face an enormous challenge as a species in the next 10, 20, 30 years. I'll go back to markets for a second. Markets, financial markets, are clearing houses for information, and they are supposed to reflect something akin to the wisdom mm. of the crowd. Mm. The crowd doesn't see peak copper. All the, all the crowd sees right now is that the Democrats and the Republicans can't 
agree on how much more American money to print. The markets have a very, very short-term view. In most of life, we worry about what we're going to eat for lunch or where we're going to sleep tonight or tomorrow. It's a very small fraction of humanity that has the ability to look long-term and deal with basic human issues. So it's easy to criticize the state of the world or to get mesmerized by the markets. But what we're talking about is the critical role Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar are playing in basic energy provision. Without that basic energy, we're not going to be able to make any form of energy transition. So if the financial markets and Wall Street rich large, writ large, excuse me, doesn't get the picture, who does? Who gets the picture? Who, who understands the message you're trying to deliver? I, I recently met a very high-ranking Royal Highness in this part of the world, and I said, Your Highness, why do you buy the mining industry as a hedge? You're along all this hydrocarbon. He said, it's a great idea. How can we do it? Um, if you, if, I think everyone in this region... Be careful region, about the ideas you uh, put in people's heads. Uh, I, think, I think in this region, um, everybody knows that hydrocarbon is a gift from the Creator. Uh, they know that wealth came out of the earth as a gift from the Creator. Metals are the same. The whole world economy depends on a stable transition to a cleaner way to generate energy. But even hydrocarbon requires metals. If you look at the energy intensity mm -hmm. of developing the North Field and expanding it to keep Europe warm in the dark, it's absolutely critical that Aramco and the other major energy providers like Qatar can maintain stability. I always try to say that I've interviewed 55 billionaires recently to check if any of them put their pants on both legs at a time jumping into their pants. I haven't found one that can do that yet. They all admit that they put on one leg, stand on that leg, and put on the other leg. We can't get to a new world in energy without depending on hydrocarbon or nuclear power. It feels to me like, at the very least, Elon Musk understands some of what you're saying. He has been drawing attention to the shortage of lithium, specifically refined lithium. Mm -hmm. Is he wrong to be focusing on lithium alone? Well, you know, he was the, he, you know, he gave the traditional automakers a hot foot and stimulated the change to the whole industry making electric cars. And people are quite focused on the cars without thinking about where the electrical energy is going to come from. If everybody in America plugs in a car at 5 p.m., the whole electrical grid is going to die. The whole grid has to be upgraded with oceans of copper to enable that to happen. Uh, a great visionary industrialist like Eon, Leon, he's not, he's not to be criticized, he, but the whole issue has to be looked at womb to tomb, cradle to grave, sperm to germ. How are you going to revolutionize the whole energy system? We need the incumbents in clean energy like LNG to even have a hope of putting on the other pad leg and developing the metals we need. Robert, I want you to help me and everyone else here take a look at this issue we're discussing through a geopolitical lens. Um, I recently read a story in the New York Times, and full credit to the New York Times, you should go and look this up. It's about how much of the electric vehicle supply chain is controlled by China. 95% mm -hmm. of manganese refining 73% of cobalt refining, 70% of graphite refining, 67% of lithium refining, 63% of nickel refining. Why isn't this being treated as a national security issue in Washington? One of the problems with the uh, concept of an energy transition in general, which requires all of these metals, is that we now have a balkanization of the world supply chain. Uh, we have distrust of China and Western societies, and now we have war, and war also uses the same metals that we need for an energy transition. Don't blame the Chinese for being good planners. 20 or 30 years ago, they thought we have 1.3 billion people. If everybody gets a hydrocarbon engine for their car, we're going to burn all the oil in the world. So they, they developed the world's largest solar industry, the world's largest wind industry, world leaders in electric cars. And using basic human intelligence, they went out and acquired these metals. Now everybody wants these metals for their national security. 
The Japanese want to build an army. The Germans want to build an army. Uh, Taiwan wants to turn itself into a giant porcupine. This is all metals intensive. And so this has become a national security issue that each nation wants to secure its supply chain right down to the metals and other fundamental tenets in their society. America has a CHIPS Act. Why doesn't America have a Cobalt Act? America has an Inflation Creation Act, which uh, is designed to stimulate um, and make it more reasonable for mining. Mining has been c considered a sin in the United States for decades. The mining industry stayed away in droves. Now the mining industry can only go to certain environments where we're allowed to mine. We can't mine in Russia. We can't mine in Ukraine. We can't mine where it rains or snows more than it evaporates, like the jungles of Brazil. So most responsible mining is done in desert environments. The, the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile, Nevada, the Australian outback. These kinds of environments are in a lot of Islamic countries, and one of our basic messages is the Islamic countries have enormous potential to develop mining industries that are in areas that have heretofore been unexplored. With or without balkanization of supply chains, do people appreciate the inflationary implications of building a parallel energy system around low, par low carbon power? No, they don't. Uh, the, the world integrated economy peaked in around 2008. And ever since then, we're starting to demonize the other and break down the integrated world economy. So the, the issue is supply. We're crushing demand by raising interest rates. The minute the Fed stops raising rates and we get past this budget crisis, we go back to building a new world. It's a supply problem that's creating all this inflation. And when we don't cooperate as a species with a just-in-time economy, as we break that down, it's very inflationary and creates a lot of tensions. I have heard you use the term militarization of the supply chain. What do you mean? Well, when we went to Africa starting 20 or 30 years ago, there was a, a, a Chinese restaurant in every little town. The Chinese were prescient. They were early to go to Africa, realizing that they had to feed their people. They had to get the raw material they needed. Now we're seeing pushback where, where every nation is worried about its basic supply chain. The Japanese and the Koreans have historical animosities. They both want their own supply chain. The Americans want their own supply chain. The Chinese want their own supply chain. Europe is freaking out about events in Ukraine. They want their own supply chain. And this is a very serious issue. And, and we're all in trouble if we don't cool it. We need to really take a deep breath. And NVIDIA just talked about this with chips, for example. We have to take a deep breath and stop this downward spiral between China and the Western world, for example. We really need to remember that we got this far with an integrated world economy. China helped finance, if I'm not mistaken, helped finance your copper mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. One of them. One of them. And they still own part of it, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So you're right. There's tension in this world. You're an American. Your company is based in Vancouver. You have, at least in one of your copper mines, a Chinese shareholder. What happens if push comes to shove? How do you, how do you choose sides? <laughs> we really need to cooperate as a species. Um, Xi Jinping recently came, the president of China, to meet His Royal Highness Mohammed bin Salman. We have a multipolar world all of a sudden. It's quite destabilizing. Everybody needs to get everybody. Uh, if you put 10 dogs in a room and put a video camera to watch those 10 dogs and leave the room, all 10 dogs smell both ends of every dog. We need to get used to each other. We're all people. And I'm very concerned about the militarization of the supply chain. If we start militarizing it, that can only lead to war. And I think it's time that all good people stand up together and say, we need to take a deep breath and stop this downward spiral. The minute Robert, we start you and I can plead for peace till the sun goes down. It might not help. Inshallah, we'll have a peaceful world. And, and uh, this region has a very, very important role to play. It's very important to keep the lights on. It's very important to keep the lights on. It's difficult to exaggerate the importance of the North Field and LNG as one of the most important transition 
forms of energy if we're even going to dream about getting to a new and better world for our kids and does, our grandkids. Does the militarization of the supply chain mean that we're entering a new commodity super cycle? I don't know about commodity super cycle. I don't know what the word need, even means. I'm saying that we need a lot of clean energy for seven or eight billion people. Uh, if we didn't have natural gas, half the population in the world would immediately starve because the Haber process wouldn't be able to make fertilizer. I think it is important that we start communicating the message of where things come from in the supply chain and how dependent we all are on each other. If you went to a Walmart store in the United States 10 years ago, 15 years ago, everything said made in China. That was the factory of the world. If we start breaking that down, ladies and gentlemen, things are going to get more expensive. And uh, we really need to take a deep breath and not let politicians drag us into a road to hell. You were in China recently. What do the Chinese have to say about this? The first thing I want to tell you is they're not the Chinese. They're individual human beings, just like all of us in this audience. They can think, they can act, and, and um, we're, we're all in this together. And they, they, you know, they see the world a different way. Uh, China is like a communal society, like a giant hive of bees. They give royal jelly to one bee and make a queen bee. But in the Quran, I'm told it's said that the honeybee is the only animal that Allah speaks to directly. So the way they organize their society is very different from American thinking, which is based on, I'm the individual, I'm God, I'm the only guy that's important, I have the right to my gun. So these two different societies think very differently, but we're inhabiting the same little planet hurtling through space. And it's very important that we start to learn from each other rather than objectifying the other and deepening the tensions. Many years ago when I used to cover the copper industry, a geologist told me, We've run out of elephants. We've hunted them all down. Elephants, of course, being giant copper mines. Mm. Uh, because if you look at a cross section of a giant copper mine, it sort of looks like an upside down elephant. Now, a few other elephants have since been discovered, including the one that you found in the DRC. Where are the elephants of the future? Are they on the bottom of the ocean? Are they in the Arctic? Are they in the Antarctic? Where are they? Are they on asteroids? It's going to be a while before we mine asteroids because we have the problem of getting the metal down through the atmosphere without burning it up. We will mine this planet. Um, when you go to the Colorado School of Mines, they have a bumper sticker that says, Earth first, we'll mine the other planets later. But for the foreseeable future, we'll be mining in new places on this planet. Afghanistan is an example of a country with a rich mineral endowment. Um, or Baluchistan, where Barak is going to build a copper mine. There are a lot of places in the Islamic world that are yet unexplored for metals. Even in Saudi Arabia, there's a massive mineral endowment waiting to be explored and developed. We just have to go to new places, and we have to look deeper, and we have to develop new technology and new ways to deal with local communities to get there from here. Absent that, we have a really profound problem. The capital markets have been largely shut to mining exploration and development for more than a decade. Why is there no money for mining? Mm. It's the tyranny of the net present value model. The Chinese don't really use a net present value model because they have 1.3 billion people to feed for the next thousand years. So they went out into the world and acquired large elements of the supply chain. They built infrastructure in Africa. They developed the Belt and Road to get access to the raw material they need to feed their 1.3 billion people. Most societies are not going to have to think more like the Chinese. You're going to have to have long-term thinking for, for basic human needs. And we have to do this in a cooperative way rather than militarizing this. In World War II, the Germans invented the U-boats. And the idea of the U-boats was to interrupt the supply chain from the United States to Europe. Had we not broken their Enigma code, the Germans could have won World War II. So we're seeing a struggle over the supply chain. And those countries that have something of basic human need, like the gas in this country, that LNG, have to play to their strengths and find a green way to provide the metals we need. And the metals underpin food, underpin water, underpin agriculture. And uh, in time, uh, God willing, we'll find the capital we need and the intestinal fortitude to get it done. How important is the capital in this room, in this region, to the Green Equation? 
It's, it's impossible to overemphasize the importance of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Qatar to the security of this planet. Now that we've embargoed Russian hydrocarbons, and the easy shale gas and shale oil has been developed in the United States, that's on the way down. Energy security has to be maintained in a very stable way so that we can get to something new. We can't just turn the lights off for humanity. So it's difficult to overemphasize how critical and how important it was that His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz was here. He came to Qatar. He emphasized we're all in one family, and I would extend that family to everybody. We need that stable role of conventional hydrocarbon energy while we engineer a new economy. And it'll take us at least a generation to get there from here. We have indeed seen extraordinarily warm feelings expressed among members of the GCC here on stage at the Qatar Economic Forum, not least, as you point out, between the Qataris and the Saudis. The truth, Robert, is that there are still many deep-seated rivalries among the ruling families in this part of the world. Tell us, what is the secret to doing business with all of them? We can pray. <laughs> Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. Ladies pray. and gentlemen, Robert yes. Friedland. Thank you.